Um, this is uh, an, a, a very important hearing as to military personnel overview. Uh, today the subcommittee will turn its attention to the important issue of maintaining an all-volunteer force that is not only faced with continuing to fight even after 10 years of war, but also is now in a period of fiscal constraints and manpower reductions. The Department of Defense has completed an efficiency review which will result in $100 billion being reinvested into the services over the next five years. The Department is also facing an additional $78 billion cut over five years to its top line, with proposed cuts by the Department to a variety of programs to include in-strength reductions for the Army and Marine Corps in 2015 and 2016. Today's hearing will focus on actions the services have taken to create efficiencies in personnel employment programs to include pay and compensation and the policies and programs that still need to be examined to successfully continue down a path of fiscal responsibility without undermining the readiness of the all-volunteer force. We will also examine how the proposed reduction of end of strength for the Army and Marine Corps will impact individual dwell time in light of unknown force requirements in the future. We are also concerned about the manpower reductions that all services will undertake and how they will employ voluntary and involuntary separation measures to achieve those reductions and how they will reduce the non-deployable populations in their services. We are joined today by an excellent panel consisting of the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel Readiness and the four personnel chiefs of the military services to help us explore these issues. I would request that all witnesses, and it's going to be tough, um, maintain an oral opening statement at three minutes. And uh, Craig Green is really tough on this, and so um, good luck. Um, but <laughs> but he, hey, he is the impartial uh, scorekeeper. Uh, without objection, all written s statements will be entered into the record to include statements uh, submitted by the Reserve Officers Association, the Military Coalition, the Fleet Reserve Association, and the National Military Family Association. I would also like at this time to introduce our panel, the Honorable Dr. Clifford L. Stanley, the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, Lieutenant General Thomas P. Bostick, the Deputy Chief of Staff, G-1, Headquarters of the U.S. Army, Vice Admiral Mark E. Ferguson III, Chief of Naval Personnel, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations, Total Force, U.S. Navy, Lieutenant General Robert E. Milstead, Jr., the Deputy Commandant for Manpower and Reserve Affairs Headquarters, the U.S. Marine Corps, Lieutenant General Darrell D. Jones, the Deputy Chief of Staff, Manpower and Personnel Headquarters of the U.S. Air Force, and I would especially like to welcome General Milstead, and General Jones, who will be testifying for the first time in their new roles and in very important positions that you have. I, at this time, will uh, defer to the ranking member, uh, the distinguished member of Congress from California, Susan Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to all of you, we appreciate your being here. Dr. Stanley, welcome back. And uh, Lieutenant General Bostic and Vice Admiral Ferguson, Lieutenant General Milstead, and Lieutenant General Jones, to all of you, um, we're glad you're here. After nearly 10 years of war, I look forward to hearing from you on the state of our military personnel and their families and the impact that the current economic climate is having on them. In recent years, the services have enjoyed both a robust recruiting environment and budget. This has led to record achievements, in recruiting and retention objectives, as well as an increase in the quality of our recruits. But recent indicators are sending a different signal. I'm concerned that as job growth continues to improve and budget reductions are being implemented, the services may find themselves back to where we were just a few short years ago, a difficult recruiting environment. The major difference will be that we may not have the budgetary headroom to quickly change course. I hope we will address this issue. I'm also concerned that the budget reductions will have an adverse impact on our quality of life programs for our service members and their families. While the services all made a good faith effort to ensure that this funding was included in the baseline budget, 
personnel and operation and maintenance funding seem to be in the first place where the services seek to reduce expenditures. Many of our quality of life programs are vital. We know that. They are vital to our service members and their families, especially during these last 10 years of high tempo deployment. As the demand for these services remains constant and the budget continues to decline, we are going to face difficult choices. But we must remember that it is our men and women in uniform that makes our military the best in the world. Thank you all once again for being here. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to, to their testimony. Thank you, Ms. Davis. And even before we begin, I've had the privilege and opportunity of meeting with each of you. And when I think of military personnel and military service, to me it's an opportunity uh, for young people to achieve to their highest possible level. And it's very personal. My dad served with the Flying Tigers in the uh, Army uh, Air Corps. So, uh, and I have a nephew uh, who's in the Air Force. So I know how meaningful it's been. And then I've got uh, I served 31 years General Bostic in the um, Army National Guard. I've got three sons in the National Guard, and each one, uh, they actually enjoy going to drill. Uh, so this is very positive. And then I'm so grateful that um, uh, another son's a doctor in the Navy. And so I know how uplifting. And then uh, my late father-in-law and late brother-in-law were Marines. So we're joint service. Uh, with that, I'd like to proceed to Secretary Stanley. Well, good morning. Uh, uh, Chairman Wilson and Ranking Member Davis and members of the committee. Um, first of all, I want to respectfully request that my written statement be made a part of the record. Um, and with this hearing, I will have officially reached uh, the one-year mark in my tenure as the Under Secretary of Defense for uh, Personnel and Readiness. But during this past year, I've focused on honoring, protecting, and improving the lives of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. This next year will demonstrate that while my focus has not changed, I will continue to refine my priorities to better serve our service members and their loved ones. I look forward to continuing to work with you and this subcommittee as we support our total force of active National Guard and Reserve service members, as well as our civilian workforce and the dedicated families that support them. My focus, total force readiness, caring for our people, and creating a culture of relevance, effectiveness, and efficiency. Uh, I, I view total force readiness as a mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual preparedness and resilience. And this involves enabling training, equipment, and supporting the total force when they are deployed and ensuring that they and their families have the care and support they need and deserve when they are at home. We've committed ourselves to supporting the Secretary of Defense in preparing the force to manage risk, preserve assets, and meet the challenges of a dynamic operational environment. We must increase the emphasis on agility, flexible force structures, responsive force shaping policies, and integrated personnel management processes. We will continue to experience global competition for our educated and skilled workforce. Therefore, it is more imperative than ever for the Department of Defense to have personnel policies that attract, retain, train, educate, and sustain the right people. As we examine the total force on all volunteer force that first emerged in 1973, we intend to go beyond the scope of our active guard and reserve force, and in particular, we're looking at the role of civilians in supporting the force, and most especially how families and volunteers fit into the total force equation. I also cannot overemphasize enough how essential it is that we continue to work in providing quality of life commensurate with the quality of service for our military and most especially their families. And we'll work to do everything possible to support our military families. Here's our families, as you well know, who support our service members, who support our nation. I want to thank the subcommittee for all you do for our dedicated service members, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. At this time, General Bostek. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Davis, distinguished members of the subcommittee on military personnel, thank you for this opportunity to appear before you. Uh, Chairman uh, Wilson, I just want to thank you for your personal service in our military and also thank you for your sons uh, and all that they've done uh, to serve in uniform. Uh, we appreciate that. And Representative Davis, I want to thank you for your focus on our people. We had a former chief of staff, uh, Abrams, that used to say that uh, people are not in the Army. They are the Army. So uh, we agree with you, and we're going to focus on our people, both our soldiers, civilians, and their families. On behalf of the Secretary of the Army, the Honorable John McHugh, and our Chief of Staff, General George Casey, I'd like to thank you for your unwavering support and demonstrated commitment to our soldiers, Army civilians, and family members. Our all-volunteer Army is now in its 10th year of continuous combat operations, 
more than 1.1 million soldiers have deployed into combat. And this has impacted not only the soldiers, but their families as well. Additionally, Army civilians shoulder the majority of the burden in the Generating Force mission. And 30,000 civilians have deployed into harm's way. Despite this unprecedented operational tempo, the Army is on track to achieve sustainable deployment tempo for our forces and restore balance to the Army by 2012. Both the Secretary and the Chief of Staff of the Army have set two priorities for the coming year. First, maintain our combat edge while we reconstitute the force, and second, to build resiliency in our people. To maintain our combat edge and sustain the all-volunteer Army, we must continue to recruit and retain citizens and soldiers with the greatest potential for service. With the support of the Congress and the nation, we are very proud to report that America's Army exceeded its enlisted goals of recruiting in our retention missions for FY10, and we're confident that we'll meet the goals for FY11. We also achieved all benchmarks marks with regard to recruiting highly qualified soldiers. Moreover, all components of the Army exceeded their reenlistment goals. Your support of initiatives and incentives remains key to our multi-year success. As the pace of the economic recovery increases, we will continue to carefully review incentives and seek your support to ensure we remain highly competitive in the evolving job market. The Army has already reduced bonuses dramatically for new accessions, as well as the retention mission. Average recruiting bonuses dropped from over 13,000 in FY9 to just under 3,000 today, and are only used to incentivize longer-term enlistments in a small percentage of critical skills. These incentives are only used to ensure the success of the total Army recruiting and retention mission and to shape the force to meet specific grade and skill requirements. Despite our success in recruiting, the Army and the nation face a significant challenge in this area due to increased obesity and decreased high school graduation rates in certain parts of the country. Currently, less than 3 in 10 17 to 24 year old are eligible to serve, primarily due to physical and educational requirements. Only one in five youth fails to graduate high school. Uh, one in five youth, 12 to 19 year old, is currently overweight, compared to one in 20 in the 60s, and this trend is projected to grow one in four by 2015. As a nation, together we must continue to address these concerns. The Army implemented a civilian workforce transformation effort that will invigorate and strengthen the civilian workforce by addressing critical issues of structure, accession, development, retention, and succession planning. This initiative will give civilians the tools and resources to plan and achieve their career goals, while at the same time providing Army leaders a workforce with the right skills and experiences to meet current and future missions. The Secretary of the Army and the Chief Staff of the Army have directed that we continue to provide services and programs to build resiliency in our soldiers, civilians, and families, and to maintain or increase, as necessary, the quality of care, support, and services that they require. We look forward to working with you as we move on a broad front to address the challenges of 10 years of war for our soldiers, civilians, and their families. To conclude, I want to thank you for your continued support, which remains vital to sustain our all-volunteer Army through an unprecedented period of continuous combat operations. Now as we prepare to draw down the Army and prepare for the complex strategic environment of the future, we will continue to work toward restoring balance and sustaining the high-quality Army. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for your generous and unwavering support for our soldiers, civilians, and families, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, and Admiral Ferguson. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the committee, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to review our fiscal year 2012 budget request. We believe our request appropriately balances risk in supporting the readiness requirements of the fleet and the joint force growth in new and emerging mission areas, and the essential programs that provide for the care of our sailors and their families. The extraordinary people of our Navy are serving around the globe with nearly 50 percent of our ships underway or deployed. Sailors remain engaged on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, and more than 24,000 active and reserve sailors are serving in the Central Command region. Our forward deployed naval forces give us the flexibility to respond around the globe at a moment's notice. They provide deterrence, support maritime security, as well as conduct combat operations, 
and are able to rapidly respond to a humanitarian crisis, as we have seen in Indonesia, in Haiti, and now Japan. Our unique capabilities and our extraordinary people stand watch every day from the Middle East to the Mediterranean to the Western Pacific. Our sustained operational tempo continues to place stresses on the force. Providing a continuum of care for our sailors and their families remains our constant priority. Our safe harbor, operational stress control, and medical home port programs are critical elements of this continuum. We continue to adapt these programs to meet the needs of our sailors and their families. We monitor the health of the force through surveys and retention data, and pleased to report that sailors indicate they are satisfied with their leadership, their benefits, and their compensation. Your support has made this possible. In developing our fiscal year 2012 budget, we reviewed current operations, our procurement profile, and our readiness requirements. This review indicated the need to add approximately 6,800 billets to the operating forces. To source these billets without additions to our overall end strength, we reduced or consolidated approximately 8,400 billets in the fleet, squadron staffs, and shore activities. Additionally, the Navy has placed end strength previously funded by supplemental appropriation into our baseline program for fiscal year 2012 and beyond. We assess our end strength request of 325,700 will meet our projected requirements. We continue to attract, recruit, and retain the nation's best talent and have met or exceeded nearly all of our recruiting and retention goals for the year. In addition, your Navy has received over 20 national awards over the past 12 months, recognizing accomplishments in the areas of workplace flexibility, training, diversity, recruiting, and workforce development. On behalf of the men and women of the United States Navy and their families, I extend my sincere appreciation to the Committee and the Congress for your support. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And General Milstead. Good morning. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it is my privilege to appear before you today. The Marine Corps is our nation's expeditionary force in readiness, and we are ready to respond to today's crisis with today's force today. In addition to the over 20,000 Marines engaged in combat in Afghanistan, Marines are already providing humanitarian assistance to those impacted by the earthquake and the tsunami disaster in Japan. We began deploying forces less than 24 hours after the disaster hit, and our numbers will soon total 2,200. The individual Marine is our Corps' most sacred resource, and the quality of our force has never been better. Part of my job is to make sure it stays that way. Regardless of any future force reductions and structure changes, the challenge of shaping our force with the right grades, combat experience, and skills to fulfill operational requirements will remain. We appreciate your continued support for the tools and funding to succeed. A top priority of the Commandant and mine is to keep faith with our Marine sailors and their families. Through program improvements and with your support, we're doing just that. Your Marines are proud of their Eagle Globe and Anchor and what it represents to our country. And with your support, a vibrant Marine Corps will continue to meet our nation's call. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. And General Jones. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and represent all the men and women of the United States Air Force. These tremendously talented men and women, the officers, enlisted, and Air Force civilians of the total force are the backbone of our service. In an era of evolving requirements and constrained budgets, our Air Force faces an ever-increasing set of challenges. As the Deputy Chief of Staff for Manpower, Personnel, and Services, I'll do everything I can to deliver fully qualified and ready airmen to the joint warfighter while meeting the essential needs of the airmen and their families. We are dedicated to properly managing our end strength. Unfortunately, with retention at a 16-year record high, we are compelled to use voluntary and involuntary programs. We expect to exceed our end strength in fiscal year 2011 by roughly 1,500 officers and could experience additional growth through fiscal year 2012 if we do not actively manage our force levels. Our force management strategy is not a quick fix, but a tailored, multi-year effort. Beyond existing force management legislative authorities, we are working with the Office of the Secretary of Defense to seek additional legislative authorities to provide the tools to better manage our end strength. America deserves the very best Air Force in the world 
and that's what you have. As a result, it's our job to recruit, develop, and retain the highest quality airmen from the broadest landscape to maintain that status. Even though quality and retention are high, we are obligating a portion of our budget for bonuses to recruit the right skill sets and retain experienced airmen in critical warfighting skills. Without these funds, we will handicap our commanders in their ability to carry out the full range of the missions that America demands of our Air Force. We are committed to streamlining and strengthening the resilience of our airmen and their families. Our goal are to build resilient airmen who have the ability to withstand, recover, and grow in the face of stressors and changing demands. We remain fully committed to caring for our wounded airmen. We continue to provide support and assistance through the Air Force Survivor Assistance Program, the Recovery Care Program, and the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program, and will do so for as long as needed. With your support, the Warrior and Survivor Care Programs will continue. In closing, today's airmen are an unsurpassed, dedicated group. They enable us to have the competitive advantage against our adversaries and, de and deliver dominance in air, space, and cyberspace. We continue to recruit, train, and retain America's finest and will provide the care and the service that they and their families need. We appreciate your unfailing support to the men and women of our Air Force. And on behalf of the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. And we will now begin the five-minute rounds, and uh, beginning with me. Uh, and, uh, and strictly adhere as best we can to this, and um, Mr. Green uh, will be uh, the scorekeeper. Uh, so um, at this time, I'd like to um, point out that I'm a strong supporter of the all-volunteer military. I've seen it work. Uh, I know, and uh, you, we do have America's finest. Uh, the new generation out there uh, is so committed. Uh, they do remember uh, the attack on our country on September 11, 2001, and so they're motivated to serve. I uh, also am very, very concerned. In the last 60 days, uh, events have occurred that um, I just didn't anticipate. Uh, first, um, we know the instability of North Africa, uh, the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, our great ally, uh, Bahrain, that is so crucial. Uh, there is instability uh, that uh, certainly uh, we need to be reconsidering uh, what force structure is. Uh, then we had um, the multiple catastrophes, disasters in Japan. Uh, here, one of the most advanced countries on earth, and our sympathy to the people of Japan. Uh, but we saw what happened to us with Hurricane Katrina. And um, again, massive areas of their country, just as uh, Katrina was massive areas of our country, um, the military is just crucial, as we see, uh, trying to um, protect the people of Japan and uh, uh, we are backing them up. I want to thank all of you. Uh, additionally, we're fighting uh, cowardly combatants uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan sim simultaneously. Uh, with that in mind, and um, uh, Secretary, and we'll go in the order, uh, whoever can answer. Uh, I I'm very concerned about a force reduction uh, in the instability that's um, just um, worldwide. Well, Congress Wilson, let me just take the first stab at that and then turn it over to the services. Um, we're also, it's not a matter of just being concerned, it's actually a top priority. Um, I was fortunate to have been on active duty in a manpower billet um, uh, at Headquarters Marine Corps when we went through this process in the 90s. And so we kind of, re I remember vividly what happened then, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, and so as we look at right now, looking at our management tools, uh, helping the services out and even going to Congress to ask for your help maybe with either a voluntary or, you know, boards and so forth that we do with separation to get the right force structure in place. And this is what uh, General Jones alluded to, but there are other things that go along in the equation. I'm going to turn it over to services and have them also address this. Chairman, as, as you know, uh, the Congress approved a, a 22,000 temporary and strength increase for the Army. And um, in that, we will come down in September of 13. And we think we've got the tools in place in order to do that properly. And we really needed that uh, because of the end of stop loss and because of the non deployable situation that we're in, in in our wounded warriors. So we deeply appreciate that. And based on the demand that we see ahead of us, we, we feel that we have the tools in place to, to bring that force down. Uh, the second reduction uh, in 27 is going to be much more difficult for us and as the Secretary of Defense said, it's conditions based for us. And we're going to hold 547 through uh, fiscal year 14. 
and over the next 15 months in 15 and 16 we'll draw down that 27,000 and the key for us is what is the environment at that time and and we're doing our plans with the G3 and the other leaders in our, our department to make sure that we do it uh, appropriately and, and we our, our number one mission which is to fight and win the, the wars for the country that we can do that uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, well, thank you. I, in the Navy, we we uh, continuously plan and assess our manpower requirements versus force structure and the demands placed on the force. And and we are in a period where we've you know we the Navy drew down from the period of 03 to 10 by about 45,000 that we came down. And so the last few years, we're in a very stable profile tied to our force structure. And and the 12 proposal has us continuing on a fairly stable uh, as we go forward. And should there be changes in force structure or reduction in commitments, then we will continue to adjust both the size of the force, and we feel we have the adequate tools at this point uh, to do so. Yes, sir. You know, um, the Marine Corps did grow. We grew from 175,000 to 202. We grew 27,000 um, uh, for this fight, this dual front fight. Um, uh, we've just uh, finished our force structure review group. Uh, it's capabilities based. Um, we feel that we can bring the core down to 186.8. That's about 15,000. Again, it's capabilities based, but it's important to to stress to you that we have no intention of of reducing our size until either 14 or we are done with Afghanistan. So, when, until we're done with Afghanistan, we have no intention on, on reducing our core. And again, it's capabilities based. Um, and so we feel that that will allow us to do what the nation expects us to do. Thank you all very much. And I will proceed to Ms. Davis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, again, for being here and, and for responding, I think, to that. I want to thank you uh, for the response uh, in Japan. I think that we always have to have that capability. I think it's one of the most important things we do is responding um, to our friends and allies around the world, especially in such a calamitous time as they're experiencing. And uh, it's, it's good that we're there and that we're able to do it. I wanted to just turn to uh, a, a few issues that, that I hear about. And when I go on base in San Diego, probably more than anything else, I have sailors who come up to me and talk about their own personal situations, especially with their children. And I wanted to ask you about the National Defense Authorization Act uh, of 2010, which required the establishment of the Office of Community Support for Military Families with Special Needs. Uh, Dr. Stanley, that was under uh, you, I believe, and I'm wondering who you've designated as the director of the office and when you think we'll be able to learn what programs and what policies are being implemented to assist families with special needs. Well, thank you, Congresswoman Davis. Uh, the, um, first of all, we have established the office um, within our military community and family policy office. Um, that office has been stood up. We've actually started uh, working with the services to determine what the services requirements may be and are. We've also launched about three different studies to actually help us as we go through the process of working with the services, uh, you know, on exceptional family members. The um, money that was associated with that did not come with that, so we work with the services and providing them uh, money to assist them in the exceptional family member program. So, uh, Do you happen to know about what, um, what, what they're able to utilize in terms of those dollars? I think $50 million was in the That's authorization, uh, 40 million was allocated to the services to carry out the, the task. I'd have to get back to you, Congressman. I'd like <clears> to <throat> take that for the record on the actual amount. All right, thank you. I, I know that the different times that we've met, I've always wanted to check in on that and find out what's happening. It's not something that's known, of course, to the families at this time, but we're hoping that they will become more aware of it and that we'll have uh, a, many vehicles for getting that information out. Uh, probably not wanting to set too high an expectation, but on the other hand, it should it should be available to them, and we need folks who are helping. Uh, Secretary Stan, I want to ask you also um, about programs which are helping in the transition. The San Diego's veterans community has been very interested in a program at, at Camp Pendleton, 
and I wanted to just commend um, Pendleton for that. It's um, the program Veterans in Piping, where a partnership has been established between the Marine Corps and the United Association that takes Marines who are about to leave the service and places them into a 16-week apprenticeship program. This program helps Marines get good paying jobs, of course, when they leave the service, uh, but the training is carried out without uh, any real cost, direct cost, to the government or to the Marine Corps. About 97 Marines have graduated from the program, and it sounds like almost everyone who's participated has um, gotten a job on leaving. So I wanted to know whether you support the program and um, would you and the administration support a revision to Title 10 that explicitly allows, but by no means would require the services to have this kind of program available on base? Okay, thank you, Congresswoman. I, I appreciate the question. Uh, I actually uh, know the people personally who are actually running the program, um, a couple of retired Marine generals, um, and have met with them, and I'm very supportive of the program. Um, have not followed up on it recently, put them in contact with not only my wounded warrior, our wounded warrior office, but also the Department of Labor. Um, I'd have to circle back with them to see where it is right now. I will say that uh, I'd have to take it for the record on whether or not that should be a Title X uh, you know, entitlement, uh, but I certainly am supportive of the program and, and the success they've already enjoyed. I'm uh, very supportive. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I'll let, <clears throat> I'll let that go at, uh, there, but I, the enthusiasm for this program is, is such that we really do need to, to follow up and make certain that we're not uh, having, having some, some issues where, where we're not able to allow people to do that um, when it really would be of, of such great benefit uh, to them as, as they're leaving. So I thank you for that, and I'll go ahead and uh, turn back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And Congressman Allen West of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Madam Ranking Member. And to the panel, uh, I can't tell you the privilege it is to having been in uniform and now have the opportunity to be on this side, but to continue to serve the men and women that make this country great and protect our, our freedoms. Uh, and uh, General Bosick, just to let you know, I, my young nephew is the artillery assignments officer down at uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, so I kind of had to talk to him last night about his perspectives on personnel. But, um, you know, when I look at the history of U.S. military operations, as, especially in the 20th century, uh, we seem to have peaks and valleys. And, you know, one of the big concerns that I look at is how we ramp up for certain things and then the next thing you know, we ramp back down. And we always seem to get ourselves caught, you know, excuse me, with our pants down. Uh, and we have seen that. I saw that when I was a Brigade S3 in a battalion XO, post the Soviet Union collapse, post Desert Shield, Desert Storm, all of a sudden we start to uh, riff and, and, and ramp down. So as I look at now, and this kind of dovetails off what the chairman brought up, how we have a a more deployed military to include our reserve component forces. Uh, we want to try to have that one to three dwell time out there. Uh, the fact that we have so severely cut the Navy from 546 ships down to 283 ships, but now we see the maritime threats that we have out there, which uh, definitely dovetails over to the, uh, to the Marines. And, of course, we have an Army that is stretched in. We have an Air Force that is, you know, needs to get back to being a force projection uh, platform. Um, my concern is this, and, and this is my question. General Cavazos, which is a great, who was a great mentor for me, always said that quantity has a quality all its own. So in looking at that, do you believe that your total force is at a steady state to support the full spectrum of the operations and challenges that we see on this modern, complex, and very fluid 21st century battlefield? Because the world as we knew it on the 1st of January 2011 is already a totally different world, and it seems that it changes just about week to week. So I just want to make sure that we don't find ourselves going into one of these valleys, because the people that ultimately uh, will have to suffer because of that are the men and women we put in uniform. So I'll uh, give my service counterparts here an opportunity to think about that a little bit as I take a stab into that. Total force, as I alluded to, first of all, deals with not only those on our active, but also our guard and our reserve. I think they're an important part of the equation, but also we have civilians who are also a part of this. And so as we look at what we're doing, that's how we're shaping and approaching this. 
the assessment, your question is actually a part of the assessment process that we're going through right now. I'm going to defer my time to the services because I know it's precious. Well, Congressman, I, I would agree with you that uh, we have taken some risk in our ability to operate on the higher end of the spectrum uh, due to the, the requirements to fight as we are in, in the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. We know that we need to train at the higher end, and for the first time uh, recently we had a, a brigade combat team at the National Training Center that was able to train at the high intensity of combat uh, end of the spectrum. So uh, we, we are rusty in that. Uh, we know that, and, and, and as we come out of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, we're certainly uh, training in that area. We're also concerned uh, that, that we get the dwell time that our soldiers and families need, as you pointed out. Uh, for the first time, we believe um, that we will have two years of dwell for our soldiers and families. Uh, when the soldiers deploy in October of this year, when they come back for the first time, they can expect that they will have two years of dwell. And, uh, and that hasn't happened for many of them for quite some time. The other thing we found that, that we have to do to address your point on uh, contracting and expanding military is that we have to look at uh, new ways to to expand our force. Uh, we have to look at lateral exits and lateral entry. We have to look at sabbatical assignments where you can go get a PhD and be away from the Army for, for three years and then come back in. We have to look at continuum of service where you can leave the active Army and go into the Guard and Reserve where you can come from the Guard and Reserve, come in active. So. All of those types of ideas is what we're looking at now because we have the same concern that we might have to ramp up very quickly and how do we do that, particularly in our officer corps, which once they leave generally do not come back. Congressman, for the Navy, the CNO has testified that um, a, uh, a floor of approximately 313 ships is what we'll need to sustain a global Navy at uh, demands that we see today and the threats in the future, and we're on a building profile to, to reach that point uh, in our budget submissions. Um, we believe a balanced force uh, with an integrated reserve that's operationalized, that uh, has the continuum of service, which we're working to, is vital. Uh, but we're making new investments. We're increasing our investment in the cyber area. Uh, we're investing in ballistic missile defense. And we're reinvesting in our warfare capabilities in anti-submarine warfare, electronic warfare, uh, in the high end uh, in our budget submission. Um, we are able, with the force structure that we have, to call on our reserves to surge, which they've been invaluable in that, and have been able to sustain in most of our areas about a 2.8 to 3 to 1 dwell time. So we feel we're in balance at this point. Sir, you expect your Marine Corps to, um, to be most ready when the nation is least ready. Um, that means we've got to be ready today. Uh, that does not, that does not uh, facilitate tiered readiness, as, as, you, as you spoke of. Uh, we can't have peaks and valleys. We've got to be ready, and we've got to be ready today. Um, I will tell you, this is the healthiest Marine Corps that I've seen in, in I'm just beginning my 36th year of service. It's the healthiest core I've seen in 36 years, and it's it's all about the people, as General Bostic mentioned. I mean, what's what sets us aside as a core is 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 people, and um, um, you know what it takes to be a Marine today is what it'll take to be a Marine tomorrow. So we'll continue to <coughs> to recruit that high quality young man and women that 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 feels uh, called to serve their nation, something greater than them. And, and I have no qualms about what the, uh, about what the future holds for our Corps. And, and uh, at this time, we need to proceed. But um, General Milstead, I want you to know that the next person is very interested in Marines being stationed uh, on her, um, in her very uh, beautiful and strategically located island of Guam. Uh, Congresswoman Madeline Bordayo. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, you've always been so supportive of our military buildup on Guam. And I just have two quick questions. Uh, as Guam is the closest U.S. neighbor to Japan, I want to thank all the services for the support you've given during this disaster. General Bostic, I want to ask you about a problem we have been experiencing on Guam now for some time. This provision, or it's relevant to the Section 621 of last year's Defense Authorization Bill. 
and this provision provided a one-year extension of authority to provide travel allowances for inactive duty training outside normal distances. Now, members of the Guam National Bar Guard live just north of Guam in the Northern Marianas Islands. These men and women have limited transportation options for training on Guam and often spend a lot of money out of pocket to get to and from drills. I've asked for a pilot program to be launched on Guam that would allow these service members to utilize this authority to defray the cost of travel. This is an important readiness issue as well as key recruiting and retention matter for our Guam National Guard. All we hear from past correspondence is that we are working on it. So my question for you is what must be done to get this program started? What can the committee do to assist in regards to this matter? And can I get your commitment to work with me on this initiative? First, Con Congresswoman, you do have my commitment. This uh, was brought to my attention. And the primary thing that we've got to work is the, the joint travel regulation, which doesn't authorize uh, this flight travel. But, but we have the issue. We're talking. Uh, with your team and the team uh, in the department, and I believe we can find a way to resolve this. But I concur with the issue. We're working it, and I will personally get back to you on it. Is this because we're located outside of the mainland United States? No, it's just it, we work exceptions to all of our regulations and policies, as you know, all the time. So it's just something that, that we've got to come to closure on. Well, thank you very much for your commitment, and we'll remember that. Uh, my second question is to General Milstead. Uh, in the Secretary of Defense's recent posture hearing before this committee, he mentioned a reduction in Army and Marine Corps end strength in the out years of the FYDP. What impact will these reductions have on the proposed Marine units that will be realigned to Guam over the coming years? And could this impact the bed down of Marines on Guam in terms of what units and skill sets will be placed? on Guam. What impact might these reductions have on our ability to participate in operations such as humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or mill-to-mill -mill engagement in the Pacific? Um, yes, ma'am. Um, we indeed uh, were directed to uh, reduce our core 20,000 over the years 14 and 15. And as I mentioned earlier, we've completed our force structure review group where we uh, briefed the secretary and, and he agreed that uh, we'd go down about 15 and it would be uh, 186.8 not to commence until we're complete with combat operations in Afghanistan. Um, as far as how that will affect specifically um, our, our bed down per units on, uh, on Guam, I'd like to take that for record if I may and, and that, that's a, a, a PP&O piece and, and I would get you a, a good solid answer that I'm not prepared to, uh, to provide at this time. Very good. Um, we'll wait for that uh, information. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for always being so supportive of our buildup on Guam. Well, I've been there, so I know how good it is and what a strategic location it is uh, and wonderful people. So thank you for your service. Uh, we will proceed to a second round uh, in coordination uh, with the ranking member. And what we'll do is uh, each person uh, will ask a, uh, another question. I, uh, as we proceed, I'm very grateful that uh, Congressman West brought up uh, maritime challenges. And Admiral, um, many of us thought that uh, piracy was uh, something that occurred uh, 250 years ago um, uh, with the Barbary pirates. We are aware. Uh, but uh, how shocking that really you have to face uh, piracy today. Uh, which is affecting world commerce and, and safety and security. And um, that's in addition to the threat from Iran. So um, I want to thank uh, Congressman West for bringing up the increasing maritime threat. Uh, I, I know firsthand that uh, active duty personnel, uh, guard personnel, reserves are, are grateful to serve. Uh, they're grateful to be deployed. Uh, I know firsthand my former National Guard unit, the 218th Brigade, served for a year in uh, Afghanistan, 1,600 troops uh, led by uh, our current, ad our new Adjutant General Bob Livingston. Uh, it was the largest deployment since World War II. Uh, but the people were very proud of their service. Uh, but something that has to be kept in mind uh, is dwell time. Uh, and as we look at reduction or, or downsizing, um, beginning with uh, Secretary uh, Stanley, I'd like to know uh, what the goal of uh, dwell time is. This is of great concern to um, members uh, of the military and their families. 
Thank you, Chairman Wilson. Um, Secretary Gates uh, set dwell time goals of uh, one to five for active and one to two for our, excuse me, one to five for our reserve, one to two for our um, uh, actually um, uh, our active uh, component. I actually think that's one to three. I think I just wrote it down just one to three. And um, the service is now moving in the direction of getting there, and I'm going to allow the services to address that if that's okay. Yes. All right. We, we would certainly like to get to one to two for the active, one to four for the reserve uh, component. Um, we, we, there has been discussion about going to three years, or, and, and it's really a one to three. So it not, it, it's one year, or what we think if you go to one to three, it could be nine months deployed, for example, and 27 months uh, back home. So that's a one to three ratio, not necessarily three years back. Uh, right now we're at one to two for the active force, and, and we believe that it takes two to three years uh, to get your family and yourself settled after a, a tour of one year in length. Uh, so, so it's important for us to get as a minimum to, to two years back home. And we think uh, for the units that deploy in October of this year, uh, we'll see that when they, when they return. And um, so, so it's very much uh, of interest for us. We're working towards that. What really matters for us, though, is uh, the end strength is important, but it's what are the demands? What are the demands on the force? If those demands come down, then within the end strength that we're directed to go to, we could still meet a one to two uh, bog dwell and a one to four for the reserves. Um, Chairman Wilson, we're meeting, as I said earlier, on the broad force. Uh, we're seeing uh, selected units go under increasing stress. And I want to make, mention our special operations forces, explosive ordnance detail, um, and, our, and our special operators in particular, uh, because their training ranges and what they need to do to work up is not co-located at their home uh, site that they spend a greater amount of time away from home in preparation to deploy and then in actual deployment. So um, we have concerns about uh, those particular forces. They're very small. But in the broader force, we manage it very carefully. We set fairly strict policies and, tra and track their purse tempo and dwell. And to break certain boundaries, the Chief of Naval Operations has to approve those. And so we feel comfortable but uh, do see some concern with those forces that are carrying the fight uh, in theater for us. And they're so effective. And Excuse me, General Milstead, I believe. Is yes, next. yes, sir. For for the Marine Corps, our our goal for our active forces is a one to two dwell, uh, and then post Afghanistan, uh, we our goal will be a one to three. For the reserves, currently uh, in combat, it's a one to four, and post uh, Oco, our goal will be a one to five. Thank you, and General Jones. Mr. Chairman, post-conflict, our goal would be one to four dwell time for our airmen um, who are very much in the fight. 37,000 airmen are deployed today. 29,000 of those are in the CENTCOM AOR. But also, we have to remember that in the Air Force, we have a large number of our forces who are supporting COCOM requirements every day. In fact, 43%, um, about 217,000 people at places like Creech Air Force Base in the Nevada desert, which as you walk through the front door, you see the sign that says you're now entering the CENTCOM area of responsibility because they're able to do their mission in a distributed fa fashion, actually flying the, the, the remotely piloted aircraft over the conflict. So we're very much involved. We need to provide, as we have bands and buckets with our different dwell times from 1 to 1 to 1 to 2 to 1 to 3, we try to focus very hard on getting those airmen that are in the, hot, the short dwell times, the 1 to 1 and the 1 to 2, to incentivize them, to give them the special bonuses to reenlist, to keep the numbers up, because only by keeping the numbers up in those, in those specialties can you, can you increase their dwell time and shorten the amount of time that they have back home with, or excuse me, increase the amount of time they have back home with their families. Thank you, and I, I appreciate I uh, appreciate you mentioning uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. I always hope with two sons in Iraq that there was one over their head. So let them know at Creech. We appreciate them. Uh, Congresswoman Davis. Thank you. I know everybody is really struggling with um, some of the personnel accounts and trying to find efficiencies out of those. We also know that we haven't given um, our, our managers a lot of room to, to maneuver um, with them as well. So much of it is, is driven by formula. But I wanted to just ask about one in particular because I, I hear about this uh, more as a work-life-family uh, balance issue 
often, and that's the the um, the change the permanent change of, of station moves. Uh, it's been considered as, as one of the efficiencies that we need to, to look at, particularly in terms of travel expenses. But I also wondered about some of the other issues, because particularly for women who are in the services and are deciding whether or not they're going to stay in the service, the fact that they and often their spouse have to move a great deal m makes a difference. We know that there are reasons for that in the different services, but I'm wondering to what extent you think that that is actually a good place to be looking to see whether there is a way to um, better create that um, work-life balance while at the same time dealing with that as a, as a budgetary issue. Or is that, you know, just not a possibility in, in the way that we might think, certainly in terms of those efficiencies? I'm just going to just make one comment, uh, uh, Congresswoman Davis. Um, we actually have started those discussions, and I don't know if we've even begun to have those discussions with the services yet as we look at um, how we approach that very important subject uh, as we look at the balancing and looking at how our forces, because as I said in our opening statement, families, they're part of this equation, uh, moves and everything. So I don't know where the services are yet on it because we haven't had mature discussions on it yet. Uh, I'll defer to them. Anybody want to comment? Ma'am, in the Air Force, um, we have increased the length of, of PCS moves or the amount of time you get to stay at, at your base over the years. And that's important because, as you point out, with the work-life balance, about 19 percent of our force are, are women in the Air Force, officers enlisted. And about 48,000 of those are joint, mili or joint spouse couples married to another service member. And we try very hard to manage the assignments of those officers and those enlisted members where they can continue to progress at their base and get them in the same general location. In some career fields, that's easy. In some career fields, that's obviously more difficult. And when they're in the same career field, it increases the, the difficulty. But we feel like we work that very, very hard, and that's something we would like to consider to work and, and try to add that stability. And I can tell you, as a, as a dependent when I was young, having gone through it with my own family, and now watching my son go through it in the Air Force, we need to focus on those family things, because that's what keeps us in the Air Force, and their ability to serve their family and also serve their nation. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree with uh, General Jones, and we also approach it similarly as a family readiness issue, a, a work balance, and a quality of life issue. Um, I'd like to present another aspect of it for your consideration, and that relates to continued operation under a continuing resolution. Um, because of the manpower counts that we operate under, uh, about 96 percent are non-discretionary pay bonuses allowances. And, and as we approach the end of the year, if we were to continue for the entire fiscal year under a continuing resolution, um, in the Navy we would be forced to start to halt moves to use those funds to pay for pay, base pay and bonuses and other things that are required. And so um, the uncertainty of our funding stream presents a challenge to our families who, who start to plan on moves and relocations and children starting school in the fall. And so uh, I would just offer that that's a, a great concern to us, that if we start to progress it later into the spring uh, under a continuing resolution, we'll have to take actions to delay moves and to slide them in the next fiscal year in order to ensure we have sufficient funds to cover uh, our accounts. I hear that is a hot topic on the Internet, on Facebook right now, among our service members. Anybody else? Congresswoman Davis, as you said, much of our budget is, is must fund for, for the Army. Ninety-six percent of our budget is must fund. So PCS and tuition assistance and education and other things that are very important to our soldiers and families are, are in that four percent. I don't think there's a lot of wiggle room in, in PCS moves. Part of our Army Force Generation model that is a rotational model and about 50 percent of the force coming back from a brigade combat team is going to have to move to schools and, and move to training, move to other assignments as they move higher in grade. Uh, what we have been sensitive to is um, uh, spouses and, and children that, that need to complete school or spouses that are in a position or a job where they want to retain that position or families that while their husband or, or wife is deployed, their soldier is deployed, allowing them to remain in, in an area where, where their housing is stable, their school is stable, and their job is stable. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll just close it out. Uh, and, and I will agree with, with everything that's been said. You know, 40 
about 47 to 48 percent of our core is married. Um, there is little flexibility in the mill pers accounts. Absolutely, it's a rob Peter to pay Paul, um, and so then you have to maintain that balance and make sure that you don't take away from the other things. Um, as Admiral Ferguson pointed out, the continuing resolution is a significant issue here uh, with the Marine Corps. Uh, if we were, were to remain on, on the CR, we're looking at somewhere close to $500 million, and we're going to have to rob Peter, and Peter is going to be procurement accounts. It's going to be other things. Um, so, uh, you know, I just reinforce what, what, what my Navy brother said. Thank you. Thank you all, and we uh, will be concluding with uh, Congressman Allen West of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member. Uh, recently, I had the opportunity to go down to uh, SOUTHCOM headquarters down in Miami. And uh, when you sit there and you get the Major General Select, Chief of Staff, uh, USMC, uh, really did a great job hosting me. When you sit down at, uh, at SOUTHCOM, you get the sensing that this is kind of the economy of force AOR. But when you get the uh, ops and intel brief, you really get concerned about some of the actors that are starting to come into that AOR because, you know, the bad guy always looks for the soft underbelly. My first question is, you know, how are we looking at our allocation of forces that we have in the SOUTHCOM AOR and how quickly we can increase the allocation of forces to the SOUTHCOM AOR? And then the second question is uh, after the uh, visit I had to Guantanamo Bay, and I, I have to tell you, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines down there are doing a fantastic job, and I think that we need to make sure we get that message out. But as we talk about drawing down forces in Afghanistan, as you know, we have the prison facility there in Bagram, and we're expanding that to uh, Parwan. Uh, if we are going to draw down forces in Afghanistan, what happens with the uh, some very bad actors, high value detainees that we have there, are we looking down the road as we you know, lessen our capability to deal with the detention facility in theater in Afghanistan? How do we increase a a level of personnel, uh, not ad hoc personnel, but how do we increase uh, a permanent uh, uh, cadre of personnel at Guantanamo Bay? and also the facilities for the families down there as well. So those are my two final questions. I yield back. Well, I, I just say we, we don't see it as an economy of force. I think with each of the combatant commanders, we provide them uh, the joint uh, personnel and all of their requirements, at least from the, the, the stable authorizations in the joint joint arena, we've been providing the Army portion of that. In terms of how quickly we could ramp up, uh, that's a good part of the reason our, our Chief and Secretary drove us to the Army Force Generation model. Right now, um, we meet all demands that, that we are asked to meet, and, and when we run out of forces, we, we cannot uh, meet others. We are trying to get to a supply-based force of one Corps, five divisions, uh, 20 brigade combat teams, and about 90,000 enablers. Uh, to provide uh, places like Afghanistan and Iraq or other locations. Uh, but, but we're not at the point where we can surge anywhere, um, and we're trying to build that surge capability. And once the demand comes down in Iraq and Afghanistan, and if a surge requirement were necessary, that's part of the Ar Army Force Generation uh, model design. Congressman, I would offer that we recognized that uh, about two years ago when we stood up the Fourth Fleet staff uh, down in Florida um, under Admiral Guillory, and uh, he reports directly to SOUTHCOM because there's a necessity for an ongoing planning effort and operational awareness of what's happening in theater, and he provides that as well as the uh, close contact with the countries of the region. Um, there's a great flexibility in naval forces. You know, the first forces on the scene in Haiti were naval forces, and the ability to surge from our various ports on the East Coast or even forces returning from theater, I think, can meet the allocation. And like the other services, we're responsive to the combatant commander and how that allocation process works. But the ongoing relationship piece, I think, is the important part that we recognize. You know, I would just add again to what Admiral Ferguson said. There's, uh, there's great flexibility in the, in the Navy Marine Corps team. Um, you know, theater security cooperation efforts in, in, that, in that area can, can have a great return on investment. Uh, when something happens, probably the, the, the COCOM's first question is, you know, where's the MU and where's the carrier battle group? Uh, I, I think that these, these give you, 
give you that sort of uh, flexibility. You know, again, our FIS rig, um, our 186.8, that's the number, and um, we feel it will allow us to still do those things and source those MUs and, and, and remain a flexible force and, and be continually um, ready to go. And, and I guess the last thing I'd say is, is we're also looking at operationalizing our reserve. I think there's, a, there's, there's more opportunity to use them in an operational role. Thank you. Sir, we're very pleased to have Air Force General Doug Frazier down commanding Southcom, and he's doing a great job. And we just spoke with him the other day, and we're trying to give General Frazier everything he needs for the the AOR that he supports. But one of the great jewels the Air Force is fortunate to support is the Inter American Air Forces Academy in San Antonio that allows us to bring members of South American and Central American Air Forces and other and police forces up and train them alongside. Our US, their U.S. counterparts and allows for those long-term relationships for when we do need contacts in those areas. And so we can provide support through many avenues in, that, in, in taking that approach. Any thoughts on Gitmo and how we can, uh, that personnel challenge, if we draw down our force in Afghanistan, which means that will affect the detention facility there? I don't have any thoughts on it because we that's not in my domain of what I've worked or operationally, if you know what I mean. Thank you very much. And as we uh, conclude, I want to thank all of you and uh, I want to thank um, Congressman West. As we were thinking of uncertainty, we've got uncertainty to our southern border, uh, whether it be the humanitarian efforts that all of you were so helpful with, with the people of Haiti, uh, but then uh, the instability of our great neighbor, uh, a country that's very important to all of us, Mexico. Uh, so thank you for what you do, and I'm delighted to hear about the Fourth Fleet. Um, uh, so at this time, unless there's anything further, we shall adjourn. Thank you.